Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm Bob DeMarco. On this edition of the show, I'm speaking with ABS Master Smith Murray Carter of Carter Cutlery. Murray learned bladesmithing in the Japanese tradition from Japanese smiths in Japan. A chance meeting as a young man with a renowned swordsmith on a trip to Japan changed the direction of his life, resulting in a many year stay living and working as a professional bladesmith. When he returned stateside, Murray figured out a way to take the learning and labor intensive process uh, for creating exquisite blades to a broader Western audience. Now we're gonna find out how he did that and a whole lot more, but first be sure to like, comment, subscribe, hit the notification bell and download the show to your favorite podcast app. Uh, that way you can listen on the go. And as always, if you'd like to help support the show, think what we do here is valuable, uh, check us out on Patreon where you can enjoy three different tiers of support and uh, interview exclusives, knife, uh, knife giveaways, and a lot more. Uh, quickest way to get there is to go to the knifejunkie.com slash Patreon and take a look. Again, that's the knifejunkie.com slash Patreon. The Get Upside app is your way to get cash back on your gas purchases. Get Upside is an app you put on your smartphone, and whenever you need to get gas, search your area for savings, claim your discount, fill up your tank, and then take a picture of the receipt with your phone. And that's it. You've just got cash back. Visit theknifejunkie.com forward slash save on gas to get the app and start saving. Again, that's theknifejunkie.com slash save on gas. Murray, welcome to the show. How you doing, sir? Uh, thanks, Bob, for having me on. Yeah, it's a great day. Oh, it's my pleasure. My pleasure. So, uh, obviously, a fascination with blades, but uh, as far as I know, it goes back very, very far in your life. Tell me first how you got into knives in general before we get into that deep dive you took uh, in Japan. Yeah, growing up as a young child, I was always fascinated by uh, martial disciplines and you know the tales of the knights in shining armor and uh, stories of heroism on the battlefield. Uh, I quickly became interested in Boy Scouts uh, when I when I was a young boy. The notion that if you uh, had a knife, you could go out in the wilderness and survive. And that a knife also was, uh, you know, a practical a tool or weapon, you know, in the hands of all these warriors. That's where the fascination began as a young child. Yeah, I think that's uh, that's where it started for me, too. Just feeling like, well, a man, a man carries a knife on his belt and takes care of a lot of problems uh, with that. I, I always... Um, I always blame 1970s TV for that, but I just felt like every man had to have a belt knife on uh, from a very early age. That's where my that's where my fascination came. Uh, so early, early on, you had knives. Was it always the Japanese culture or the Japanese knives and uh, martial disciplines that drew you in? No, I think the the Japanese uh, component came later. Uh, I think from, you know, even before I was 10 years old, I was fascinated with knives and wanting to own them. And I would uh, stop and gawk at the folding knife display at the hardware store. Uh, in sporting goods stores, I would just immediately make a beeline for their uh, hunting section. And I would, you know, look at the rifles and the knives and other tools that uh, a a person could use to survive in the wilderness. And then, you know, TV, again, as you said, you know, there was so much in the 1970s that had to do with uh, war and survival. And uh, then kind of uh, in the early 80s, we had a, you know, we had the Karate Kid and we had a lot of uh, movies about martial arts. Uh, you know, Bruce Lee, I think, and some of the others, Chuck Norris had really paved the way. Uh, and all of a sudden, Hollywood realized that there was a huge demand for martial arts movies. And then many movies started centering around Japan. Uh, you look at uh, even the Die Hard series with Bruce Willis 
uh, the whole idea that they were they were trapped in the Nakatomi building and this idea that Japanese industry you know was a force to be reckoned with around the world. And then again in the early 80s, uh, the world suddenly became fascinated with uh, the whole allure and folklore of the ninja warriors. And uh, it seemed like there couldn't be enough books or movies uh, or TV programs about them. That's kind of when the, the Japanese component really uh, started becoming prominent for me. I read a book called The Ninja. Was that by Eric Van Lusbader? I can't, I can't remember. But in that series of books, there were a lot of uh, scenarios from Japan and food from Japan and views from Japan and Japanese culture and Japanese business meetings. And it, it, uh, that author did a very good job at whetting my appetite for the, you know, the, this, this mysterious country called Japan, which I couldn't find out a lot about. Uh, this was pre-internet days in the early eighties. And I do believe I went to my local library in Halifax, Nova Scotia, Canada, where I uh, was born and raised, and the it, this was the Halifax Public Library, you know, serving something like three hundred thousand people, and all I could find was one Time Life magazine from the nineteen sixties on Japan. <laughs> I mean, I really could not find any information on Japan, and and any information we had was outdated. So that only served to. Uh, kind of tantalize the, the the senses even more, and and deepen the desire to to learn more about what seemed to be the most fascinating country in the world. How what would you how would you describe Japanese culture and uh, you know whether you contrast it against our culture or not? What what are the uh, hallmarks of Japanese culture? Uh, you know, to understand the essence of Japanese culture is to understand their geography. And, you know, Japan has uh, been plagued by natural disasters for as long as anyone can remember. And I don't think there's a generation of Japanese people anywhere in the four main islands of Japan that uh, doesn't know somebody personally that has perished or been severely injured in either a, uh, a volcano or a typhoon or a tsunami or an earthquake. Uh, it it's, has shaped the landscape, literally, and it's shaped the psyche of the Japanese people. They're just constantly living in a state of wondering when the next shoe is going to drop. And that's why they work so hard. That's why they save so much. That's why they're group oriented. You know, in Japan, they have an expression, toi shinseki yori tonari san. And uh, it means that you, you would favor your neighbor with no blood relations over a distant relative. And the reason is, is that when calamity strikes, it's your neighbor who's going to be there to help you out. So, you know, the, the Japanese have this rich history of kind of putting aside their petty differences, putting on a face of cooperation in public. This come, this is like honne and tatemai. Uh, honne means like what's really in their heart, which doesn't usually get expressed. And tatemai is the face they put on for uh, uh, public unity. So... You know, they just they, they value highly the, a sense of unity within the country, uh, a, a, a kind of a homogeneousness of, of, of thinking and values. But most importantly, this notion that when disaster strikes, everybody is there to help each other. So that I don't know of any other country personally. I'm sure there are some, maybe some island nations. I, I don't know of any other country that's just been so wrought with natural disasters that it's shaped the you know the the, the, the uh, you know the personality of the of the citizens there probably exists but I in Japan it's very much uh, evident 
in their behavior that it's been shaped by centuries of natural disasters. From an outsider's perspective or the perspective of someone who doesn't know much about Japanese culture, it does seem like the uh, Japanese people approach everything with a sense of artfulness or or with a sense of practice. I don't know if art is the right term, but um, or I don't even know if practice is the right term, but it seems like um, uh everything is so mindfully considered, uh, in, in, in practice, um, you know, everything from flower arranging to obviously sword making to shooting a bow, uh, to, uh, I don't know, you name it, you know, you would know way more than, than I for sure, but it seems like everything is sort of approached with a certain care and artfulness. Yeah, most definitely the Japanese in general have a propensity for taking, any sort of skill set and you know perfecting it down to the nth degree uh i've never thought so deeply as to make the connection between what i said earlier about you know the the, the their character and natural disasters and this notion that uh take for example the obi which is the long belt for a woman's kimono i think it could be like over 30 feet long and, and some of these obis uh, are just intricately embroidered. And, and the embroidery can take months and months and months and all done by hand. Uh, and even though some of these obis are 10, 20, thirty thousand dollars, I don't I don't even think that in many regards is probably even really fair compensation for the amount of effort or time that's taken to make them. But I think, I think there's a, a fulfillment. I think maybe when you don't know exactly how long you're going to live and you can't count on longevity, you never know when the next tsunami is going to take you out. It's almost a way of leaving your mark in the world through these artistic skills, whether it's Urushi, which is the lacquerware, or some of the metalwork, or even the tatami craftsmen. Uh, the calligraphy, the scrolls, the woodworking, the carpentry, uh, you know, or, or uh, for example, in the textiles, as I just mentioned. I think there's probably a connection there, but, um, you know, it's not something I've spent a lot of time thinking about. Yeah, yeah, I think I think you could be right. When you're waiting for the next uh, shoe to fall, you you might uh, you might find that beautifying your situation is a way to, you know, get through. Uh, how, how do you think, uh, well, why don't you describe for us Japanese blade culture? And I know, I know that's, uh, probably a very much broader thing than most of us can consider, but tell me about that and tell me about your experience in meeting, um, sensei Yasuyuki Sakemoto. Is that how you pronounce oh, his yeah. name? Nicely done. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah, please tell me about that experience meeting him and where that led you. Well, I'm excited to tackle this question that you asked about Japanese blade culture because I've never really, I don't think I've ever expounded on it before. So I'm, I'm, I'm interested to see what I can come up with. Great. If when we say Japanese blade culture, let's uh, break that down into two categories, people who make blades and then people who use blades. And then within people who use blades, we got people who use blades professionally. And then we have the, the blade uh, aficionados, the blade connoisseurs, the, the enthusiasts. Mm -hmm. So really, we've got three things here to talk about just off the bat. Uh, in terms of blade manufacture, you, you do kind of have two different schools of thought, the modern uh, you know, efficient technological production of knives, and you have the uh, you know, the, the the diehard ardent uh, uh, curators or uh, those who those who represent the traditional techniques, the artisans who who are who are uh, preserving the traditional techniques. That's what I'm most familiar with. So I'm just going to brush over the, the modern production 
Uh, you know, you have certain centers in uh, like Seki City, Japan, and in uh, uh, a few others, Tokyo amongst the others, and uh, in also in uh, I want to say Niigata, but that's not that's not where I'm thinking. It, it'll it'll come to me in a minute. You have you have uh, centers of cutlery production where they've really you know they're using CNC machines, laser cutters, uh, in, you know induction induction forges for for heat treating and so on. You know the latest and greatest technology in order to produce the uh, you know the massive amounts you know in, in terms of sheer numbers of pieces of cutlery you know for export and. You know the you know uh, Gerber and and Spiderco and Almar and several others you know from the 80s until really the year 2000. We'll say from the 70s and for about a 30 year stretch there. You know Japan was the place you went to if you wanted a high quality, uh, a manufactured piece of cutlery. Uh, you know to 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 OEM uh, or, or what's that whatever that means I forget but you know made 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 to order. Uh, you know, that's since been eclipsed by uh, Taiwan and China, who can do just as good as work, but for, for less expensive. So, so Japan's kind of fallen out of the massive manufacturing position that they held there for several years. Uh, th that being said, there are some, uh, <clears throat> before I talk about the crossover, where we've got like forged knives made in mass quantity let's now look at the uh, artisan who's preserved the traditional techniques mm -hmm. the the uh two areas of bladesmithing that stand out the most one would be obvious to most people the other one maybe not so uh is obviously the katana kaji the sword smiths who are preserving the traditional techniques of uh uh you know folding and refining their steel in pine charcoal <clears throat> and uh, laminating uh, both a uh, mild iron and uh, hardenable steel together in one blade and, and, and making a, a superior cutting implement uh, that way, usually for decoration uh, because no, nobody's really using swords in their daily life anymore. And the other not so obvious uh, art is in uh, preserving traditional techniques is the uh is the japanese bladesmith who specializes in making plain blades and chisels for the mia daiku and the mia daiku are the uh carpenters who who specialize in building temples and so they have they have the most intricate uh woodworking techniques and almost all of their techniques is done by hand and for that they need uh, really good saws chisels and planes uh, so the, the, the bladesmith making those tools is highly esteemed, but it's a very, very niche, uh, area of bladesmithing. And, you know, there's probably only four or five bladesmiths in Japan who, who are renowned for doing that specifically. I would say that, I don't know if it might be more than five or six, honestly, I don't know, but the number must be significantly less than the active swordsmiths in Japan. Where do the kitchen knives, the, the kind of knives I see at the sushi bar, where do they fit in? So historically, every single little village in Japan, right at the center of the village, would have had a bladesmith or a blacksmith that was also well-versed in making blades, amongst other things. And the reason is, is that the, the blacksmith in the center of the village was responsible for making all of the other tools for all the other tradesmen. You know, you know the, the, he made the carpenter tools. He made the tools for the tatami guy. He made the tools for the people doing uh, masonry and so on and so forth. So, uh, so typically, everyone in that village purchased their new kitchen knives if they didn't have some from before they would purchase them from their local village bladesmith. And so the local village bladesmith, who, who, who was not a swordsmith, uh, generally speaking, was very adept at for, quickly forging 
very thin, high performance, uh, you know, really thin and water quenched knives for use for, you know, for, for keeping everybody in food in the village, you know, keep keeping them fed, keeping them making meals. <clears throat> so their skill level would have been really high. Uh, as Japan modernized and industrialized post 1850, uh, there would have been big centers like Sakai in Osaka or to to Tochigi uh, uh, on the island of Shikoku that would have mass produced these hand forged knives and fill in the gaps as some of these village placemiths retired or passed away and didn't have anybody to take their place. So all of these sword smiths that they, uh, ones making the uh, Miyadaiku carpenters tools, the planes and the chisels, and even these kitchen knives, they all uh, have this in common. They all uh, use very pure, clean, high carbon steel, which is further refined and further purified by heating it in a solid fuel forge, either coke or pine charcoal, which is carbon rich, oxygen, uh, uh, it's low in oxygen, carbon rich. And uh, they purify the steel by heating it very attentively, hammering it and reheating it at a lower temperature. So all of these, the swords, the these other blades that I've mentioned, all of them start out at a I'll try to do something here with my hand. Here. They all start out <clears throat> at a bright orange heat and they hammer them. And then when they have to reheat them to hammer them again, they heat it at a lower temperature and then they hammer it. And then they reheat it at a lower temperature and they hammer it. And, and a blade might be hammered up to a thousand individual hammer blows and it might be heated 10 different times but the goal is never to heat it twice to the same temperature so that we might start off. I'm, I'm backwards here. It's difficult. We might start off at a bright orange heat. But as we're hammering it for the very last time, we're at a dull cherry red color. And that's the secret behind high performance Japanese forged blades is reducing the heat with each successive reheat and continuing to hammer it. So they would all have that in common. The other thing they would all have in common is that they would all be coated in clay, very, very thin clay, and then heated up and quenched in water, lukewarm water, in order to harden the blade. That's a consistent technique through all of the different bladesmiths uh, special, you know, who specialize in different tools. And then lastly, all of these tools would be ground on stones that were cooled with water. Either, and that would either be mechanically, either electric, with electricity or with uh, water powered or human powered, but uh, they were ground thin after they were quenched and cooled while they were ground to preserve every little bit of rock will hardness that was there inherent in the steel from the water quenching. Gotcha. I, I, <clears throat> pardon me. I got a couple of questions here. Uh, what is the reheating and bringing the temperature down each time do? Does that help bring carbon in from the solid fuel? How do, what is that for? Well, I'm not a metallurgist. And so this is my understanding is that all steel has grain in it and from the mill, the grain is typically large. That's the term is used, large grain. And the goal is to create small or fine grain. And the reason is, is that there's no inherent strength difference between large grain and small grain in the grains. The difference is, is that the smaller the grains, the more grain boundary there is where one grain is touching another grain. And and it's the grain boundary, it's that chemical bond in the, in the grain boundary that makes steel strong and resilient to, to, to stress fracture. So steel 
that has fine grain can be harder yet still flexible. So it can be harder yet still durable, which is kind of a contrast in terms. And right. it can be harder yet easy to sharpen if it has fine grain. You don't have to be a metallurgist. You just described it perfectly, actually. I think I get it, <laughs> especially with the with the grain walls, you know, touching each other. Yeah, the more surface area there is holding itself together, the stronger it's going to be. And that process, I guess, does that because you you keep pounding it down and reducing it, heating it up, pounding it down and reducing it. I mean, you're not reducing it, but you're squashing it together, right? Oh, man, that's, that's a terrible explanation, but... I'm a it, steel. I'm a steel squasher. That's all. It just stands That's to reason that you'd be making title. the. <laughs> Smith is steel squasher. ABS. Hey, who needs that when you're a steel squasher? Okay, I I uh, I think I think I get that, um, but I I like the idea of uh, this um, putting it in and really carefully attending to it, not just th putting it in a uh, a a, um, a a forge and kind of walking away from it like. I don't know. That's how they depict it on uh, Forged in Fire, you know, and then they also say never quench in water on that show. Uh, and that's something that you've just described, too. So obviously there's there are different processes to doing all of this. Um, and in Japan, it's, you know, it's an ancient or a process refined over uh, hundreds and hundreds of years. So how, what was it like for you learning this process? What was your apprenticeship like? Well, I had a very atypical apprenticeship. Uh, if we think of the Karate Kid, where there was a sequentially learning, wax on, wax off, you know, paint the fence this way, paint the fence that way, and uh, and slowly incorporating that into you know more and more advanced skills over time. I did not have an apprenticeship like that. Nobody sequentially. Uh, metered out lessons for me and uh, you know once I finished lesson one then I would proceed on to lesson two I know I was able just to jump right in uh, Sensei Sakimoto's forge and hammer steel and quench and quenched it you know be even before I knew anything about what I was doing so I really had trial by fire and uh, my learning mostly involved making something and then taking what I had made to a bladesmith and saying, here, I, I, I made this. What do you think? And that turned out to be uh, a lucky strategy because, you know, if you ask somebody for a secret or for, you know, hard earned knowledge, they would be very apprehensive just to share it with you. But when you've already demonstrated, you know, the willingness to apply everything you've learned, they almost can't help but uh, want to be generous to help you, you know, because your blade is bent and twisted or not sharp or uh, too obtuse or too acute or, uh, you know, bad, bad grain structure, or bad handle design, whatever it is, uh, a knowledgeable person almost can't help themselves from giving feedback to someone who's already had this sincerity to actually go ahead and make something and, 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 and then show it to them. I'm not saying that everyone should go make something and go to Japan and see how that works for them, <laughs> but it did work for me. Yeah, it did work for me. And and now, you know, I hear of dozens of North Americans or a, a dozens of Westerners, probably some from Europe as well, who are over in Japan studying Japanese bladesmithing. So, uh, you know, the 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 ice has been broken, and uh, it's not. Uh, it's it's not an impossible mission anymore like it kind of was. You know, I kind of beat the impossibilities, but now I think there are avenues for people to just go over and learn bladesmithing now. I When I'm over in Japan, I encounter Westerners all the time who are apprenticing with so-and-so, and I mean, good, good for them. Yeah, and, well, good for tradition. I, I believe that... Uh... You know, we should not ever hastily throw any tradition away. It's a tradition for a reason. It's time tested for a reason. And uh, so it's it's good for the the life of 
of uh, of that tradition as well. It's just kind of interesting seeing Westerners do it, right? That's not, uh, but that's you know supposed to be the beauty of globalism, or the, supposed to be the beauty of a small world, is that we all get to share in each other's cultures, uh, just as long as we don't get too uh, defensive about them or or what have you. Uh, so, was it? Did you encounter when you were there any sort of um, resistance or just curiosity in a Westerner uh, at that time learning? Uh, yeah, I did. I did. And, you know, it, there was some drama and probably in, in hindsight, I created most of it. Uh, I didn't have a, a whole, I didn't have great social skills going over to Japan and I have, you know, alcoholic tendencies. So when people started drinking in Japan, I was only too, too, too glad to jump, jump in the, 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 the what is it? The foray, uh, you know, jump in amongst them and yeah. start drinking as well. There's a, a word that uh, was on the tip of my tongue there. The, the fray, I think. The you fray, were yes. yes. <laughs> the fray, yeah. Or so close. Too many letters. So, uh, yeah. And so, you know, I, I inadvertently, you know, burned some bridges I probably wouldn't have otherwise. And uh, it would be fun to go back now at 53 with, you know, my current temperament and, and experience, you know, go along the same path and experience all the things I did. Uh, I think I think the net result would have been far different. I mean, it wasn't a bad result that I went over and learned a lot, uh, but I, I could have done it with a little less friction. I think. Oh, that's interesting. I guess that's something that only age brings, you know. Uh, but I well. I, I am uh, I'm catching up to you right quick, and at this stage of my life, I look back uh, at a lot of things, and and at least that uh, that dumb chutzpah of being young gets you to do stuff in the first place. Who knows with your with your current temperament, you might not even go over and do that at this point. You know, sometimes it takes the gumption of youth. That is a valid point. That is a valid point. So working in um, in Sensei Sakemoto's um, forge. What were you making and what was he making? Uh, well, Sensei Sakimoto spent a lot of time doing uh, sharpening and repair of a lot of different agricultural tools, not just sharpening different uh, culinary knives, but uh, he did a lot of sharpening of farmer's tools uh, one tool in particular that's uh, very difficult to construct and uh, fairly difficult to maintain is the uh, Yama Imo Hori, which is a which is a uh, think of a long broom handle, but but large, like an oar, you know, in diameter, and then uh, terminating in a really a two foot long straight thick blade that was used for for digging up special mountain potatoes hmm. and so uh that, that's highly specialized tool and uh, he would both make those and refurbish ones that came back you know came back in for for sharpening or repair uh there's the ubiquitous uh sickle also known as a kama that every uh farmer has a uh a stash of for really thick ones to, to really thin ones just for cutting grass. So there's always sharpening and repair of those. There's a lot of forestry tools that are still used a daily, uh, kind of like a machete, but you know, for hacking through the, the jungle growth there for doing like land surveys and so on. There's a lot of sharpening and repair of those. Those are called koshi nata. And then speaking of koshi nata, you have nata, which are also used for splitting kindling and chopping bamboo and so on. So uh, he was involved with a lot of that, but I wanted to specialize in knives. And initially, I just wanted to make some outdoor knives. In other words, you know, something that looked like a Bowie knife, so something something smaller than a Bowie knife, but something that looked like an adventure knife is <laughs> what my original interest was. And that goes back again to the childhood days where if you got a knife, you're good to go. You know, it's never going to run out of ammo. It'll never let you down. Uh, I do want to say right here, you know, while 
as a child, I was fascinated by weapons and warfare. That's not part of my current ideology. Uh, I have a new ideology now, and I've turned my I've turned away from looking at knives as weapons or as offensive tools. And uh, I, I have a very a, a strong new sense of direction about that. So I am definitely referring to things in the past and past values when I'm talking about you know blades as 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 uh, possible weapons to hurt other people. So uh, that being said. I quickly realized that to get good at making these outdoor knives, I was, I was going to need to master the Japanese kitchen knife because when it came to uh, straightness and untwistedness and uh, all around reliability and usability, uh, you can't beat a kitchen knife that's being used three times a day to cook meals. So that's how... I started to start, you know, started to focus heavily on the Japanese kitchen knives is because I saw it as a means to an end initially. But with time, I became to appreciate, you know, the kitchen knife making process and the value that a high performance kitchen knife adds to somebody's life. And so it actually brings me more satisfaction and meaning these days than making outdoor knives. It it is like the kitchen knives. Kitchen knives in general are where the rubber meets the road. It's what everyone uses. Not everyone carries a pocket knife. Lots of people do, but everybody uses some form of kitchen knife. So uh, yeah, if you have this talent and this ability to make beautiful knives um, through this very old time tested process which adds value to the knife in in my opinion um it makes sense that kitchen knives would be a place where you could flourish because you could get them in the most hands exactly yep well so when you came back well first of all actually before you come back to the united states uh how did your whole apprenticeship uh end uh with um sensei sakimoto uh, I'm sorry, could you repeat the question, please? You're saying before I came back to the United States, yeah. how yeah. did the apprenticeship, and then I yeah. lost after that. Oh, how did it end? How do you, do you sort of like have a, do you graduate from an apprenticeship and, and become, you know, uh, how did that work uh, for you? I see. I see. Yeah. I see the nature of your question. <laughs> Look at that picture of uh, me when I was young. <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I saw uh, that. Uh so the relationship is still a vibrant and you know while my interest in knives is what brought us together uh you know for 18 years we kind of did life together and uh we weren't living in the same house but we would cross paths with enough frequency that you could say we were, we were good friends i mean it, clearly it was you know mentor apprentice relationship but there was, I believe there's also a genuine friendship. And so and I called him up a couple of weeks ago, actually, and invited him from Japan to our grand opening here at our new shop in Council, Idaho, which was the 2nd of July. And he was all set on coming, even though it was fairly short notice at two weeks. Uh, but his travel agent talked him out of it because uh, she thought there might be complications with covid restrictions and protocols so uh it unfortunately didn't work but but i mean i called him up to tell him about something that was happening in two weeks and he was ready to drop everything and come so that that's i think that's a great indication of of our relationship and uh yeah i love him very much and uh i'm i'm, I'm i'd like to stay in touch with him yeah i i I would imagine that's a that's the sort of bond that that lasts forever, and to check in and yeah, that's that's got to be a very deep root there. Um, so you come back stateside and you want to figure out a way to bring these beautifully made knives through this traditional process to a broad audience. How did you make that happen? Well, once I became more serious about bladesmithing, because in, initially it was a hobby, because I was teaching English 
over in Japan as an occupation, you know, for my livelihood. And that would have been daunting when I was first dabbling in knives to consider what it would take to replace, you know, the $3,000 a month salary I had teaching English by, by making and selling knives to generate the same amount of money. And keep in mind, when I was making kitchen knives back in the day, I sold them for $50 each. Mm. So, you know, that's, uh, that's, that's daunting. That's, that's, that's like 60 knives. So, uh, is that right? Is my math correct? Six, 60 times $50. Is that 3000? I think so. Yes. Yeah. So anyway, uh, I, I saw that if a fellow wanted to get serious about knife making, then he was going to need to go where people go as it has to do with knives. And I found out there were these great organizations here in North America, like the American Blaze for Society and the Knife Makers Guild, uh, that put on annual conventions or, or what we usually refer to them as knife shows. And uh, I, I paid my table fees and applied and, and flew on an airplane from Tokyo over to probably California was one of my first, although I think the Blade Show in Atlanta was the first knife show I ever went to here in North America. And, and, and brought knives, put them on the table, and boy, I was so surprised by the response of the customers. They would, you know, stop by, ask intelligent questions, buy, buy some knives. I, wow, this is great. I can make some knives. Sell them for $50. I got $50 <laughs> for a, a hand forged, hand welded, hand forged. So no, I was, I was very encouraged by that and, you know, started a, a, a clientele here in the United States fairly quickly. And it, it would, it would only take going to the same knife show three times before I would have a steady stream of customers swing by my table and talk and chat and get caught up and buy more knives. And I was pretty much, you know, 25, 30 years ago, I was pretty much the only fella at a knife show who had hand forged kitchen knives. Hmm. And then all the other bladesmiths started buying my kitchen knives. And I remember one time my uh, sister came to a knife show and she, she, uh, she went to Tim Hancock's table. Tim Hancock, unfortunately passed away a couple of years ago, but he's a very well renowned, highly uh, uh, revered artistic bladesmith. Uh, he's called like the Western bladesmith. And uh, he just, he's left behind an amazing body of work. Uh, but anyway, my sister went up to Tim and said, oh, and my sister knowing nothing practically, it was her first ever knife show. She said, oh, do you make kitchen knives as well? And Tim Hancock's response was, well, why would I? Murray makes kitchen knives and he makes enough for all of us to buy them. <laughs> so there's no need, no need for us to make any. So that was kind of neat. I mean, I, yeah. I took that as a compliment back in the day, and it, it encouraged me to keep plugging along on the course I was on. So I am kind of got sidetracked. I'm not sure if that answered your question or not. Well, um, it's taken me there. You now have a shop with a number of apprentices that you have um, tutored, that you have uh, mentored, and... Um, they are learning what you are teaching them. They are learning what you have learned. Uh, and I think it's a really cool structure with, with how uh, Carter Cutlery works. Can you describe it and tell, tell us what the Muteki knife line is? Sure. Uh, so where to start? Uh, there was a point in my career where... I was convinced that you couldn't teach these skills to another person. I mean, it, it was a, it was a young, naive, immature uh, uh, thought, but it just seemed so difficult that you really had to you really had to have an intuition for bladesmithing. In fact, we amongst certain bladesmiths, there's kind of a cute popular saying that says that bladesmiths are born and not made. And it's, it's probably just a little bit of like pride about, you know, the career that we've chosen. Uh, but I, I was a little too high up on myself thinking, there's no way I could teach this to anybody. So why bother? But then I did uh, have some students come in for a week for a fee. 
and I taught them how to make knives. And I did that a couple of times over and over again before I realized, wow, if you explain things in a clear and concise way and then demonstrate it and, and bring people's attention to what they're looking for so that they can then become their own teacher, that it's eminently teachable. In fact, you could probably teach it just about anybody who has average hand-eye coordination, but, but, but above all has the motivation. And so I started uh, taking on apprentices full-time to, to teach them how to make knives. Initially, it was to help me with my production. So I would forge the blades, someone else would sandblast them. Uh, I would cold forge them, they would scribe them and cut them out and grind them, drill the holes, then I would quench them, I would straighten them and they would do the rough grinding, I would do the final polishing. They would do the rough handle work, I would do the final handle work. And so I had a few apprentices that helped me with my production, uh, but there were certain, well, first of all, you know, it's got my name on it. And sometimes somebody who touched my knife, an apprentice would inadvertently scratch it. Now I've got to sell a knife that's got my name on it with a scratch. So that didn't quite seem right. Hmm. And then secondly, uh, you know, I wasn't doing all the work myself, but it had my name on it. So somewhere along the line, I had this one apprentice that I've been teaching since I was 15. I said, look, you know all the steps now. Why don't you just make knives under a different brand and we'll call it Muteki brand and I'll mentor you and I'll check the quality control and we'll just have a profit sharing business model where you get 50% of the sale price of every knife that, that, that you make. And the other 50% will go towards the materials, the cost, the overhead, the insurance, the, you know, et cetera. And hopefully it'd be a little, profit for the company left over as well. And so that's kind of how the Muteki program uh, took off and flourished. And to date, you know, we've had probably 20 uh, Muteki apprentices that have spent anywhere between, you know, six months and five years working with us before either going on to a different career or striking out independently and starting their own knife shop. So when you go to the Carter Cutlery website and you view all of the uh, knives on offer, you'll see that uh, some of them are made by, you know, various, various apprentices. Uh, some of them are made by you and you can actually, well, you can, you can see that difference. But in terms of, not in terms of the knives, uh, that's not what I'm suggesting, but in terms of, um, well, exclusivity. But when you look at these Muteki knives, you'll see different makers marks on them. You'll see the, uh, you know, your makers mark or the the Carter Cutlery makers mark. But you also see, or I guess it's, you see their makers mark and the Muteki makers mark. I right. think that that is a, I think this is a really cool way of doing it, um, because, well, because it's going through your, uh, you are basically you basically have their back you've taught them what they know they're they're making their own knives and then you're checking them out and to me that's a, a really cool way of doing it it's it's giving the uh the artisans the credit for what they're doing but you know the buck also stops with the company and i think that's a great model well that's right we we have knives that may have been sold eight years ago under the Muteki lineup that were forged by one of the early Muteki bladesmiths that might be, you know, chipped or, or, uh, you know, fall, you know, needing repair in some form or another. And, you know, I have to do it. Uh, obviously I'm happy to do it, but as you say, since we sold them through Carter Cutlery at the end of the day, I accept responsibility for every knife that we've ever sold either in the Carter or the Muteki lineup. Uh, but the, but the bladesmith did get the chance to make the knife and build his reputation and build up his muscle memory and his repertoire and his own customer base. And most importantly, uh, solidify the foundational techniques of forging Japanese uh, high carbon steel and uh, developing their own nuanced work, developing a style and a flavor that is uniquely their own while they're here before going off on their own. So are they doing their versions of various models 
that you that Carter Cutlery offers, or are they just kind of making what they want to make and and that's that? Here at Carter Cutlery, you mean? Yes, yes. Yeah. I'm talking about the Muteki. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So the uh, we we have a uh, an employee handbook where we've addressed all the different scenarios that have come up that we had needed some to sit down and discuss and form some sort of uh, decision on. And uh, essentially the decision was once somebody graduates the Muteki program, which is three months long, and of course not everybody graduates, uh, if they graduate, then they get a key to the shop, they can work their own hours, they can make anything they want out of a, out of a limited selection of materials that we have here on hand. Not they don't just they can't just use everything that we've got immediately. Uh, and then they get their profit share anywhere between 55 to 65 percent of the sale price of the knife. So, uh, well, no profit share is not 55 to 65 percent of the sale of the knife. There's a fixed cost that comes off the top, and then they get 55 to 65 percent of of what remains, which usually boils down to 50 to 55 percent of the sale price of the knife. Anyway, those details aside, basically they can make anything they want. They have some guidelines, like they have to complete 20 knives in a month. That being said, we had some uh, not success stories come in out of the Muteki program where people have spent three months learning all the fundamentals, making kitchen knives, making neck knives, making limited amount of outdoor knives. And then all they wanted to do is make some sort of a fantastical camp knife that that really nobody wanted to buy but this person really enjoyed making and they had a whole inventory of these knives and they couldn't sell them and then their wife literally made them quit and go get a real job because because they didn't get paid they don't get paid until the knife they make sells mm. so we so since then we highly highly encourage them to, to that 80 percent roughly 80 percent of their production be bread and butter blades that aren't fantastical that aren't a, you know monstro yeah. monstrosity long or big and not little tiny knives but you know knives that most people and you know most the kind of patterns that sell well then if their sales are up they got money in the bank and they've produced their 80%, you know, in the coming months, then they can take a week or two and they can experiment with some project they, they, they want to have fun with that might not pay off. Right. But then, they're, but then they're encouraged to get right back into their bread and butter work again. And that's, it's not, that's not for my sake. It's, it's for their sake so that they can, so that they can keep that they can earn enough money so they can afford to keep making knives. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's good to, to know your audience and and if you're producing knives for carter cutlery it's it's probably a given that you don't have people who are looking for short swords coming to carter cutlery they're going elsewhere for that kind of thing or fantastical knives or whatever so yeah it makes sense to work within uh, those tomahawks. parameters what's that tomahawks tomahawks yeah 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 which we Tom love here <laughs> uh but yeah that's not where they're going to carter cutlery yeah. They're uh, they're going for the outdoor knife. Uh, when I met you at Blade Show, thank you uh, to Clay, uh, Clay who introduced us from Knife Magazine. Uh, I had a chance to check out your knives, and they are stunning. And uh, that neck knife is sweet. I love the neck knife design. Um, but I've been threat not threatening. <laughs> I've been saying I need to get a custom uh, kitchen knife, a nice kitchen knife. I have a collection of knives that is uh you know that i'm very proud of but it does not really extend into the kitchen and I, I i don't know why i have neglected that because it is the most used knife and uh i can get serious buy-in from the wife that way too yeah but check this out i mean this is pretty appealing right Look. yes that is quite appealing that is a beautiful knife so well, how long have you been making that neck knife uh let's see i was in japan and i was down at a show in florida and a guy who was working for customs and security border security he looked at a fishing knife that i was making at the time 
and I think he bought one. And he said, you know, if you put that knife in a Kydex sheath and hung it from your neck, it would be a perfect neck knife. And I'm like, a neck? what's a neck knife? I've never heard of a neck knife. And so uh, I researched it. And uh, of all people, Bud Neely, hmm. uh, he, uh, yeah, of the Knife Makers Guild, he was very kind and generous in coaching me internationally uh, on a long distance phone call on how to uh, maximize the use of Kydex. I'd never molded Kydex before. I didn't know what a heat gun was. I purchased some Kydex and left it sitting on my workbench for six months. And every time I passed the workbench, I'd glance at it and it was kind of just taunting me. Like, you know, I, f I felt like I was in over my head with this Kydex. <laughs> And anyway, uh, uh, as I said, uh, Bud Neely coached me through my first Kydex sheath, and I just saw how practical and, and fairly straightforward the process was, and I've been making neck knives ever since. And now currently, for, the largest, for a larger part of my career, I would just generally say that sales were split evenly between neck knives and kitchen knives. Huh. I don't know what that means in terms of numbers, but we'll just say for the benefit of the doubt that my production was also split 50-50. Uh, now I think I'm leaning more towards the kitchen knives, probably 60-40. Yeah, probably 60-40. What do you what do you want uh, Carter Cutlery, uh, how do you want it to be remembered? How do you want it to go into the future? Uh, do you have any um, you know future goals for the company? Yeah, it just occurred to me that when I said 60-40, I meant 60 favoring kitchen knives. Kitchen knives. Yeah, yeah. I, got I don't know that. if I made that clear. Okay. So the future of Carter Cutlery. That, Bob, that's a great question. <laughs> I'm, I'm not your guidance counselor. But... You know, honestly, I've been doing this for 33 years. And I can tell you one thing that's on the, I love making knives. I'm always excited to get in the forge and start the next batch. I'm just finishing up two ivory handled uh, jewel Damascus knives right now for a special customer down in California. I almost never take custom orders, but once in a blue moon, I do for the right person. If the project interests me and if all my other ducks are already in a row. So I did take on this project and I'm finishing up probably tomorrow. So I'm really excited to get in the forge and start the next 50 kitchen knives. I already have the steel cut out. It's already in a box. Some of the knives are already pre-forged. So I'm just chomping at the bit to get to them. And I think I'll always have that excitement about my next batch of knives. That being said, I am working on my certified flight instructor license in helicopters right now. And I'm building time. I need about 30 more hours before I could teach in a Robinson helicopter. Oh, cool. And so the strategy is buy a helicopter. I should complete CFI in the coming months. I've already started the process. So, uh, and I'm a commercial pilot, not, not all that uh, proficient because I don't get to fly that often, but, uh, you know, finish my CFI, buy a helicopter and teach in it part-time. And I'm thinking like maybe 14 to 18 hours a month. That's about 12 hours of teaching and two or three hours of just leisure flying. So uh, teach in the helicopter, which is mostly cerebral, so that I can add longevity to my knife making career. Because, you know, my hands are already arthritic. Every now and then I have, you know, back or neck problems because I'm always leaning over the grinder doing repetitive mm -hmm. work. You know, I've made 31,000 knives on the same grinding machines. So you can see that you're going to have that that repent those problems that come from repetitive work right All right uh so you know the idea is to you know make knives three days a week fly two days a week now, that being said i also i also am very interested in uh teaching and doing some uh mission work and uh sharing my first love and passion which is the bible so I'm not sure how that is going to pan out, what direction that's going to go, but I'm leaving that in God's hands. But I don't, I'm not going to tell you that for the next 30 years, my plan is to make another 30,000 knives. Right, right. I'm, well, kind I mean, of, I'm kind of winding, I'm kind of, I'm kind of looking to the future to wind down 
because let's face it, even though I'm a good bladesmith, uh, you know, the world's full of good bladesmiths and the world is full of high performance knives and making another 10 or 20,000 knives for humanity's sake is, is not that consequential. One, one day, it's, it's not going to matter if I made an extra five knives or 50,000 knives. But being able to speak into the life, uh, you know, wisdom, being able to speak experience and wisdom into the life of young people in the future, especially in this troubled world, you know, sharing hope and wisdom with them from the Bible, that's very appealing and uh, something I definitely would like to pursue. Uh, well, I would uh, I would argue you've done some of that already in in teaching creativity to some people. I know it's not exactly an an exact analog, but you have you know uh, taught people how to be creative and how to release that part of themselves. So you're I would say you're on a good you're you're on your way. Not only that. But um, <clears throat> like Doctors Without Borders, you could teach people who need those tools how to make them. But uh, I don't know. That, that, that's also appealing, going into like Liberia or some third world country where, uh, you know, they've been war torn and uh, poverty stricken. And yeah, teach, teach, teach uh, 10 street boys how to put a forge together and, 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 and yeah, create a sustainable business that would help them and their community. That that would be very meaningful for sure. Murray Carter, thank you so much for coming on the Knife Junkie podcast. I'm really uh, I'm really happy that Clay was like, oh, you got to meet him. You got to meet him and and pulled me up to meet you because it was a pleasure. And uh, and I'm glad we had a chance to to talk right here. Um, thanks for coming on the Knife Junkie podcast, sir. I really appreciate it. No, it's uh, it's been very fun. Thanks, Bob. Oh, it's my pleasure. Take care. Do you use terms like handle the blade ratio, walk and talk, hair pop and sharp, or tank like? Then you are a dork and a knife junkie. All right, there, there, you, there he goes, ladies and gentlemen, Murray Carter. Uh, you got to go to the website, Carter Cutlery, and check out uh, if you're unfamiliar with his work uh, and the work of his Muteki uh, uh uh, bladesmiths. I don't know if, if I can call them that, but uh, what beautiful work they do and what an interesting story. It's uh, odd. The past two uh, past two people we've spoken with have a, a, a very strong connection with Japan, and that was not on purpose, but I find tremendously interesting. Uh, so thanks again to Murray Carter, and thank you for watching and listening to the Knife Junkie podcast. Be sure to join us again next Sunday for another interview and Wednesday for the midweek supplemental. And of course, I know you're not going to forget Thursday. Thursday Night Knives live, 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time right here on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitch. Well, thanks again. And for Jim, working his magic behind the switcher, I'm Bob DeMarco saying, until next time, don't take dull for an answer. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at theknifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Mm -hmm.